The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. John chapter 6, we'll be reading verses 1 through 21 there this morning. In John chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Now he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to even get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. There was a great deal of grass in that place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, give us ears to hear your words and not mine. May the words we hear from you be ones that call us ever deeper into this life of faith, exemplified in your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. What do you do when you know that no matter what you do, it won't be enough? I was sitting in the lobby of a bank, of the bank in my hometown. I had an afternoon meeting with the vice president of that branch about a small car loan I needed to take. You see, the week before, uh, Sally and I were driving in my rebuilt Toyota Tercel, following, yeah, I fit in a Toyota Tercel, by the way, Uh, just barely. We were following some of our friends from our Sunday school class down to the lake when a man in an old maroon Plymouth Voyager decided he needed to turn left more than I needed to go straight. And so it totaled my little red car. I remember sitting on the side of the road having to switch the key off. It broke the CV shafts and the engine was still running. But after settling everything after the accident, getting my CD player out of the car, uh, Sally had had a little cut on her arm where the passenger side mirror had come in uh, because we didn't have air conditioning, so you know the windows were down. Classy car. But after settling everything with the accident, I decided I was going to buy myself a sky blue Chevy S10. But here's the thing. I didn't have any money. And so I called the man down at the bank and scheduled a meeting with him the next day to talk about that. I was sitting in that lobby and I was nervous. Back then I always got nervous at the bank because, and even a little now, because I can swear they can smell it when you ain't got money, right? 
It's like they know he's poor. I get this. But I was waiting out in the lobby, waiting for the man to wave me into his office. I saw him. He opened the door, looked around, spotted me, and said, come on, come on. I sat on the other side of his desk in a blue leather chair, checking out the taxidermy ducks on the wall in his office that was unusually small, I thought. And then I started to explain to him what happened. Well, you see, I had a car, but we got in an accident. It totaled. They didn't have insurance. I may not have had insurance. And I told him about how I needed a car. I was going to go back to college. It was the beginning of the summer. I had a job to start the next week. I remember he looked at me over his glasses and just sort of, okay, and looked at his computer and started pecking my social security number in. And then he began to read down the list of obligations I already had. He said, I see here a student loan, a student loan, another student loan, cell phone bill, another student loan, some other stuff. And then he said, well, you, do you have a job? I said, well, now that you may, no, no, I don't have a job. Not yet. Not yet. I'm supposed to start working next week, though. Okay, he said, well, do you have any, any money in savings? You know, it's funny you should mention that. I don't, I don't have a savings account, no. He said, can your mom and dad lend you money? I just laughed out loud. I think people in the lobby heard me. He typed a few more things on the keyboard and then looked at me and said, well, let me talk to one or two folks this afternoon and I'll call you in the morning. I knew what that meant. You knew what that meant, right? It meant I was done. I mean, who in their right mind is going to lend a few thousand dollars to a 20-year-old kid with no job, with too many bills to pay, and no money in the bank? I mean, there's nothing I can do. What do you do? Well, no matter what you do in the moment, doesn't gonna, it's not going to change anything. There's nothing I could do, nothing I could do to change any of those circumstances, nothing I could change to make my bills disappear, Nothing I could do in that moment to open a savings account that already had money in it. I couldn't go back in time and help my parents make better decisions so they had money to give to me. There's nothing I could do to make the job that was waiting on the next week start a month before. Nothing I could do to change what was there. So I was toast and I knew it. I mean, what do you do? What do you do when no matter what you do, it just won't be enough. I suppose you could pray, which is what I did, and looking back on it, at that time it was probably the most earnest prayer I had ever prayed, and looking back now I'm a little ashamed of it. I remember praying, God, if you'll just help me get this truck. But none of us have prayed that sort of prayer, though, right? I wonder, I wonder if that had crossed Philip's mind at all, to just Stop for a moment and pray. After he saw this crowd of thousands, the same crowd that Jesus saw, and then he looks at Philip, and you notice what he asked him? Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? I mean, to me, I don't know Philip. He's been dead a long time. But it seems to me that Philip was probably one of those people who approached problems systematically. One of those folks, you know, who probably carries around a calculator and a legal pad or has some kind of app on his phone. Philip was probably the kind of guy, when the disciples went out to dinner and the check came, he pulled it out and began to figure out to the penny what the tip was going to be, right? That's how I imagine Philip was. I mean, did you notice... Did you notice his reaction to Jesus' question? Which John, by the way, conveniently tells us, oh, Jesus was just asking him because he already knew. He already knew what was gonna, he was going to do. Jesus says, where are we going to buy bread to feed these folks? And Philip doesn't shrug his shoulders, doesn't pull out his Sam's Club card and say, well, we can go get a few loaves down at the club. No, no. He has a somewhat more precise response. Jesus says, where are we going to get bread? And Philip says, six months' wages would not buy enough bread to give everyone even a taste, even a little. You get this image. Maybe I do. Maybe you do, too. Jesus is standing there looking down at the crowd. You know how, looking off in the middle distance, there's violin music playing somewhere. And then there's Philip. One, two, three, four. He's counting. And then he's figuring up a nickel apiece, and then, but we, we ain't going to have it. It's too much. 
What's more, did you notice, Philip doesn't even answer Jesus' question. Did you notice that? Jesus doesn't ask Philip, how much is this going to cost? What does he ask him? Where? Where are we going to get bread? And Philip answers, how much? Y'all don't know anybody like that, right? You say, hey, I think we're going to go out to eat. Oh, yeah, how much is it going to cost? They don't ask you where you're going. Isn't that something? You don't suppose that we can get too distracted by the wrong answers to the wrong questions when we're faced with what seems like an enormous obstacle, do you? I mean, surely we don't try to get two steps out ahead of Jesus, two steps out ahead of God, and trying to figure out the answer to a question that God isn't even asking, do we? I mean, I'm sure not one of us in here has ever had a sleepless night spent running every scenario in our mind after the boss comes by at about 4.30, says, "Uh, tomorrow morning when you get in, can you stop by? I need to talk to you for a bit. None of us have ever lied awake at night, laid awake at night after the doctor says, well, I need you to come in. There's some some test results I want to talk to you about. None of us have ever sat awake in bed and thought about every possible scenario that could happen the next day, have we? No. No. None of us have ever gotten caught up in that deadline we're facing or whether or not we can keep the house if they lay us off. We've never done that, right? But Philip definitely seems to be doing that. Jesus asks him about where? Where can we buy food for these folks? And Philip, all he can say is, well, this is how much it's going to cost. I don't know. Maybe Philip should have been looking up bakery reviews on Yelp instead of calculating how much it was going to cost. Of course, Philip isn't the only one who puts the cart before the proverbial horse. In John's Gospel, the fourth Gospel, we often get Philip and Andrew in pairs. And so here's Andrew. Jesus is asking where, Philip is asking how much, and Andrew's ahead of the curve. He's had one or two classes in college. He's out there doing some community asset mapping. He comes back. Andrew says, there's a boy with five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Five barley loaves and most likely two dried old fish. This is the saltine crackers and potted meat of Jesus' day. You know what I'm talking about. This isn't caviar. This isn't canned foie foie gras and a fresh baguette. No, this isn't a nice lunch that he picked up down at Panera on the way out. This is a poor kid's sack lunch. It's the kind of lunch that when he takes it to school, the teacher says, you're going to have to sit over there because the rest of us can't really stand the smell. And so Andrew has scoured the crowd and all he can rummage up, some old potted meat and saltines. And he's got it ready. Do you notice that? He's got it ready before Jesus asks him anything. Jesus asks Philip, where are we going to buy bread? And then here comes Andrew. Oh, I found somebody. I found a boy. But what if Jesus was planning something just around the corner? What if this was like, you know, right before the triumphal entry, Jesus says, y'all going into town, you'll find a fella, he's got a donkey. I set it all up. What if it's like before the Last Supper? Where are we going to celebrate the Passover, Jesus? Don't worry about it. Right on into town, I've set it up. I got it there. What if Jesus had already had it planned? What if the caterer was on the way? And here's Andrew. I found a boy with, with some fish and some bread. What if Jesus had cracked his knuckles, right? Said, all right, where are we going to get, where are we going to get bread to feed these folks? And John sets the scene. The festival of the Passover is near. And after Philip says, well, we don't have enough. What if Jesus was about to say, oh, yeah, watch this and manna fall from the sky. What if he was about to give everybody a coupon to the Golden Corral of Tiberias? I mean, and then there's Andrew. There's Andrew, believing he was doing the right thing, comes to Jesus with the best rations he can find among this gathered group of the curious. You don't suppose that we can sometimes jump the gun, do you? Try to figure out an answer to an insurmountable problem before we have all the information. Surely we never try to put together a solution we know isn't going to work just to say we tried, right? Right? I mean, none of you have ever done what I'll confess that I've done, hand in the paper to the professor because they said a minimum of five pages, and you got it on page five because maybe you 
you, you fooled around with the margins. Maybe you found that font that makes the words a little bit bigger, right? None of you have ever done that. I know I'm the only one. None of you. None of you have ever sat, sat there watching the clock, waiting for that 60th second of the 60th minute of the 4 o'clock hour so you can slide in front of everybody, punch your card, and go home. No. Nobody's ever done that, right? But I get the feeling maybe, maybe, just maybe, this is what Andrew is doing. I could be wrong. He, like Jesus and Philip, he saw the crowd. He knew what was coming. He knew it was going, getting on up past lunchtime. But he also knew there was no way they had enough to feed everyone. And so he took off to try to find a solution. And when he came up with, it was incredibly short. He may have said to himself, well, you know, I've been with Jesus for a while. If I at least try, maybe he'll pat me on the back and say, good job, Andrew. You get an A for effort. I don't know. I do know what happens next. It was so powerful. In fact, it's the only sign that Jesus does that's recorded in all four Gospels. Jesus takes the boy's barley bread, his dried fish. He blesses it. And according to John's version, Jesus himself passes it out to the 5,000. And after everyone is eaten, they take up 12 baskets of leftover bread to say nothing of the fish. John says Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Jesus already had it figured out. But his disciples, they seem to be tripping over themselves in an attempt to either dismiss the task as impossible. It's too much, Jesus. We can't do it. There's too much. No matter what we do, it won't be enough. Or at least show that they tried. Well, here's a few saltines. At least we tried. But it doesn't matter. Jesus just carries on. Doing what Jesus does. And there's more than enough for everyone. There are even leftovers. So what do you do? What do you do when no matter what you do, you know it won't be enough? Well, you trust Jesus. You trust that Jesus has it covered. The disciples get two chances to learn that, by the way. Two chances in the passage before us. Because after this feeding of the 5,000, the disciples decide to get on a boat and head back to the Jewish side of the lake. <clears throat> and on the way, the gospel tells us it was now dark. Jesus, still up on the mountain, still praying, and not yet come to them. And the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. So it's dark, the water is rough because there's a strong wind, a storm is coming. So what do you think these disciples, professional fishermen who'd been out on that same lake, most, more likely, what do you think they did? Do you think they looked over their shoulder and said, well, we're still in shallow enough water, we can make it back, just hang out on the shore till the storm passes, we'll make better time? Do you think they did that? No. Do you think they dropped anchor and said, well, it's not that deep here. We can ride it out, and when the storm passes, we'll have a clear path ahead. Do you think they did that? No. Do you know what it says? You read it. I read it just a minute ago. They rowed about three or four miles. Have you ever rowed a boat three or four miles? It's pretty, pretty rough. Through the wind, through the rough waters, they just kept on rowing. Of course, I suppose... There may be some of us who do the same sort of thing. When we're faced with something that seems impossible, something that might chew us up and spit us out, what do we do? Just put our head down and plow on into the waves, into the storm, because we're too stubborn to stay put, too impatient to turn back. So we've got to keep on moving. But what if our desire to keep going, what if in our desire to keep moving, we wind up leaving Jesus farther and farther behind. Now sure, Jesus will catch up. He's Jesus, right? He'll catch up. But when he does, it's not always in the most desirable way. Did you notice that? We know this story, Jesus walking out on the water. But the gospel says when they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat, were they happy? Were they excited? What does it say? They were terrified. So what if in our desire to just keep rowing, we wind up even more scared, even more confused? I mean, what do you do when you know that no matter what you do, it just won't be enough? 
What do you do when it won't be enough to feed 5,000 people? What do you do when no matter how hard you row, you won't make it through the crashing waves? What do you do when you're sitting at the kitchen table with a pile of pink envelopes and red stamps on them, and no matter how many times you punch the numbers into the calculator, there's still too much month at the end of your money? What do you do? What do you do when you stand in the trailer park and there's 67 trailers, Somebody's floor is rotting out, there's sewage in their yard, and the kids can't go outside because the meth house next door just keeps rocking all night long. What do you do when you try and you know it's not going to be enough? What do you do when you don't have a job, when you don't have any money, and you got too many bills, but you still need a car, you still need a ride? What do you do when there's too much to do and not enough time to do it? What do you do when no matter what you do, you know it won't be enough? I mean, it won't ever be enough, though, will it? Is it ever enough? Do we ever do enough? I mean, because there's always another day to get it wrong, right? There's always another day to mess something up. There's always another minute you could have spent, another dollar you could have given, another word you could have said. There's always a better way you could have handled that conversation. A better, a better way you could have done that job. A nicer way to have spoken to your wife. A kinder tone to have taken with your kids. Yeah. I mean, truth is, no matter what we do, it won't ever be enough because we can't solve every problem. We can't feed every hungry belly. And we can't get everything right all the time. We just can't. And so many folks hear that and think it's just awful. What a terrible thing. They get depressed by the sheer size of life's hurdles. But I can't help but think that there's something to all of this. Some, I, I, I don't know, when, when Jesus sees 5,000 people and there's not enough food, the only word that comes to mind that there's something to all of this is grace. I mean, that's what grace is, isn't it? That no matter how much I do, it won't be enough, but Jesus still has it. No matter how much I have to give, it's not enough, but Jesus has got plenty. Jesus still feeds the masses. No matter how hard I row, the sea won't turn calm, but Jesus will do it. Jesus still cares enough about me to walk out in the midst of the chaos that is my life, all the uncertainty and way overhead, my head depth that I've gotten myself into. And no matter how much I do, it won't be enough. But that's okay. Because Jesus has it. No matter what I do, it won't be enough. And here's the thing. Jesus still loves me. No matter how much you do, and I can tell you right now, it won't be enough. That's okay. Because Jesus still loves you, too. It's not up to you alone to feed 5,000 people. It's up to all of us who follow Jesus as He leads us to feed them together. It's not up to you to plow through the storm alone. It's up to all of us to remember why we're on this journey together in the first place and that Jesus is enough to get us through it. It's not up to you or me or this church to solve all of the world's problems. Believe me, I wish we could. No, it's up to us to be faithful in following the Christ who calls us wherever we are and wherever we may go to do as much as we can with as much as we have, trusting that even though there's no way it's going to be enough, Jesus still somehow makes it enough. And there will be more than enough. So much, in fact, that when all is said and done, folks will be taking home leftovers. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit, help us to see, Lord, the truth that, that no matter what we do, it's not enough. But help us, Lord, not to see that as a depressing thought. 
but Lord, one that gives birth to grace. To know that, God, we don't have to do everything. We don't have to do it all. That, Lord, even when we give what we have and it's not enough, Lord, may we trust you to make it even more than enough. Holy God, be with us as we now come to this time where we listen for your Holy Spirit. Speak to us, Lord. Show us the way you would have us to go. Show us what you would have us to do. Speak to us, God, and remind us that no matter what we do, Lord, it's not enough. Because you've got it. And you call us to give what we have with all we have. To trust you that you'll make it more than enough. Be with us now. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.